Welcome to Ozark First Assembly. We're so glad you're here with us today. If this is your first time, thanks for taking time out of your schedule to be with us. We hope that you feel at home here. Before we start today's message, we want to let you know about a few things coming up here at OFA. We're excited to announce that Connection Groups will be starting in August. We hope that as many people as possible will be able to join. Be sure to sign up at the Welcome Center to be a part. You can see a staff member for more details. OFA Kids will be having a back to school pool party July 29th from 7 to 9 p.m. at the Ozark City Pool. You can sign up at the Welcome Center and you can see Pastor Matt for more information. Engage Women's Retreat will be held September 15th through the 17th at the Springfield Camp. The cost is $120 per person. A $40 non-refundable deposit is due by July 31st. The $80 balance will be due September 11th. Please turn in your money to Julie Watley and you can sign up at the Welcome Center to join us. You don't want to miss it. Men's Retreat will be September 22nd through the 24th. The cost is $130 per person. $50 will be due by August 31st, and the balance will be due on September 18th. You can sign up at the Welcome Center and see Pastor Brian for more details. There will be a youth pool party July 29th at 5 p.m. at the home of Michael and Julia Gassett. You can see Pastor Scotty for more details. We will be hosting two baby showers next month. We will have one for Emily Davis on August 1st and another for Claire Ivy on August 30th. If you would like to help or have any questions about the showers, you can see Julie Watley or Danielle Boatwright. Be sure to check us out on our website and our Facebook page for more announcements and to stay better connected. Again, thanks so much for being here. We're expecting a great service. Psalm 55, verse 22. I love what David writes here in the psalm. In this verse, he says for us, and Peter alludes to this as well, cast your burden upon the Lord and he... The Lord will sustain you. He will never allow the righteous to be shaken. Now sometimes maybe when we read this verse, we say, well, wait, Lord. Your word says that you will never allow me to be shaken. But God, sometimes through things in life, I feel shaken. But what's important for us is to understand what this word shaken means. It doesn't mean not to be disturbed. When the wind blows and we look in the trees, what happens to the trees? They're disturbed, are they not? The limbs are disturbed. The leaves are disturbed. We can see the effect of the wind blowing on the trees, but the tree isn't shaken, is it? And what I mean by that, shaken in this sense means to be uprooted. To be uprooted like a tree in a storm. So we can feel... And often we do, the wind blowing upon us, yet it's not able to uproot us. And that's what David is saying. I will cast my cares upon you, O Lord, because I know that you will what? Sustain me, keep me rooted, because I'm rooted in you. And you, O God, I know, will never allow me as your righteousness as your child to be shaken, to be removed from being rooted in you. Amen? Can we stand together? There's so many reasons to praise and adore our God. Are there not? So many reasons. And this is one above many. I don't know what you may be faced. We all face different things that can disturb us. But in Christ, we will never be shaken. Why? Because He sustains us. We will never be uprooted. So can we lift our voices in celebration of who He is? I'm not minimizing whatever difficulty or whatever is disturbing your life, but I'm here to affirm the Word of God this morning. You will not in Him be shaken. You will not be uprooted. So can we lift our voices right now and thank Him? Lord, we thank You and praise You God, for the reality of your word, your word is the truth. And Lord, when we commit our hearts to it, Lord, it says, David says, Lord God, we will cast our cares upon you, O Lord, because you are the one who sustains us, and you will never allow us as your children, as the righteousness of Christ, to be shaken. Lord, thank you. 
thank you we may be disturbed. The wind may blow, which it does, but we will never in you, in Christ, we will never be uprooted. We will never be shaken. Oh, God, help us to turn our eyes and our hearts upon you and worship you with all that we are this morning. Come on, as they lead us, let's do that. Turn your heart, turn your mind upon him. Worship him with everything that is within. Jeremiah chapter 12, Jeremiah chapter 12, and we begin reading together verse 1, notes are on new version so you guys can turn to your app and you'll find the notes for the message there. Jeremiah writes, Righteous are you, Lord. When I plead my case with you, nevertheless, I would discuss matters of justice with you. Why has the way of the wicked prospered? Why are all those who deal in treachery at ease? You have planted them. They have also taken root. They grow. They have also produced fruit. You are near to their lips, but far from their mind. (coughs) But you know me, Lord. You see me and examine my heart's attitude towards you. Drag them, the wicked, off like sheep for the slaughter and set them apart for a day of slaughter. And notice what Jeremiah prays here. How long is the land to mourn and the vegetation of the countryside to dry up due to the wickedness of those who live in it? Animals and birds have been snatched away because people have said, He, God, will not see our final end. Father, we do thank you for your word. And Lord, we just pray through the leading of Holy Spirit, that, Lord, you would lead and guide us through your truth, that the word, your word, may be profitable in and through our lives for your glory and the advancement of your will. In Jesus' name, we humbly pray. Amen. So let's just set the stage this morning. Jeremiah. His prophecy began, or I should say his ministry began in the nation of Judah. In fact, his ministry, being a prophet, was directed toward the southern kingdom of Judah for its last 40 years. The last 40 years of its history, and if you were kind of looking, it would be somewhere between 426 B.C. to 586 B.C. And Jeremiah received his call from God to prophesy against Judah's idolatry at a very young age. In fact, it is estimated that he was about 20 years old when Jeremiah received his call from God to prophesy to the people of Judah. And although he actually received his call as a young man, when the Lord was confirming this, God told him, that he was literally born for this task. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 5, the Lord told Jeremiah, before I formed you in the womb. Now some individuals say that, uh, this is a side note, some individuals say that when it comes to abortion, the only scripture we have that supports our stance is pro-life is Psalms 139. Well, no, it's not. Jeremiah 1.5 also says, God says, I knew you before I ever formed you. In the womb. So there's you another one. And before you were born, the Lord says in Jeremiah 1 5 to the prophet, I consecrated you, I have appointed you a prophet to the nations. Now, after informing Jeremiah that he was born and that he was destined to just this time, it wasn't a mistake, it wasn't a oh-by-the-way moment, he was destined by God for this time and for this task, 
And having reached out, God says, his hand and touched Jeremiah's mouth to place his word within him. Just read Jeremiah chapter 1. The Lord gives Jeremiah the greatest assurance that could possibly ever be given to us as his children and his servants. Read with me verse 17, 18, and 19. The Lord tells Jeremiah, now belt your garment around your waist and arise and speak to them all that I command you. Do not be dismayed before them, or I will dismay you before them. Now behold, I have made you today like a fortified city and like a pillar of iron and walls of bronze against the whole land to the kings of Judah, to its leaders, to its priests, and to the people of the land. And they will fight against you, but they will not overcome you. Why? For I am with you to save you, declares the Lord. So Jeremiah tells or is told by God from the very beginning, you're going to have difficulty. They're going to fight against you, but don't be dismayed before them because I am with you. And because I am with you, I am. And notice that Jeremiah said that, I am. I am. That comes from John, right? I am with you, and the I am will save you. So after chapter 1, Jeremiah begins his ministry. And he's prophesying against the kings. The kings of Judah and their princes and her priests and all the people for their idolatry and for their spiritual adultery against God. And it appears that up to this point that Jeremiah's preaching has been primarily in and around his hometown of Anath. And because we know this, because when we look at Jeremiah 11, we find that the men of Ananoth have already told Jeremiah, you need to shut your mouth, and if you don't, we're going to shut it for you permanently. Now, that's in my wording, but that's what they said. Read it, Jeremiah 11. And sadly, it was so bad that we're told in verse 6 of chapter 12 that even his father and brothers are plotting against him. And the Lord warns Jeremiah not to believe. Just look down. you got your Bibles open there in Jeremiah 12. Look at verse 6. The Lord warns Jeremiah not to believe the nice things that they are saying. So God commissioned him. God gave him the greatest encouragement in chapter 1. You're going to face difficulties, but they're not going to overcome you. Because I'm with you. Jeremiah's walking through this, and he's walking in his hometown of Ananoth. People are turning against him, and now we come to chapter 12 that we've just read the first four verses, and Jeremiah is getting discouraged in his calling. Have you ever been there? Just one of us. We all have, haven't we? You know when I say that, I'm just joking, right? Okay. Oh, I really am. We all get discouraged, and we find Jeremiah in chapter 12 getting discouraged in his calling. He has come down with the case as I have and as we have when we're discouraged in our calling. We come down with a case of whys and how longs. Whys and how longs. Look at verse 1 of chapter 12. Why has the way of the wicked prospered? Why are those who deal in treachery at ease? Then look at verse 4. How long is the land to mourn and the vegetation of the countryside to dry up? Jeremiah found himself struggling with a crisis. And what was that crisis? He tells us in verse 1. Why has the way of the wicked prospered? Why wicked people prosper is an age-old question that has been around long before you and I were ever thought about. It's a question that has been asked frequently by God's servants in Scripture. Job, the man who was familiar with misery, amen? He asked that question. He struggled with it. Job 12, 21, because his amigos kept telling him, Job, if you just repent of whatever sin you committed, God heal you. And Job's defending himself. I haven't done anything. I haven't done it. Lord, why are the wicked prospering? And you know my life. I haven't done anything. The psalmist 
have tried to understand it. We read Psalms 37, David speaks of it. In Psalms 49, David speaks of it. In one of my favorite Psalms, Psalm 73, Asaph, one of the priests even says that, that I almost lost my footing in looking at the wicked. It seemed like they were prospering until I came into the sanctuary of God. Other prophets besides Jeremiah grappled with this issue. Why do the wicked prosper and God's people suffer? Habakkuk. Verse chapter 1 even speaks to it. The, the, God tells the prophet, I'm going to use Assyria to punish my people. And he stumbles over that. Lord, why are you using wicked people to come against Israel? Malachi 2, 17, 3, 15. These individuals wrestled with this question, why do the wicked prosper? And Jeremiah is deeply troubled by the treachery of his own people. We need to understand when we read here and what he's troubled with the wicked, he's not talking about people from another town or from another neighborhood, if you will. These are people that he has grown up with, people from his own hometown, from his own nation and country, people who knew better. And he acknowledges from the very outset that God is completely righteous. Notice that's what he says in verse 1 in the very beginning. Righteous are you, Lord, when I plead my case with you. So in other words, Jeremiah isn't accusing God of being unjust here. But at the same time, he was upset, if you will, about the way God was handling things. He has questions about the success of the wicked in light of his own trials. And Jeremiah realizes that prosperity is not accidental. But it goes back to God's grace in providing life, the basic necessities, the basic needs to all humanity. Look at verse 3. But you know me, Lord, or verse 2, I'm sorry, you have planted them, talking about the wicked. They have also taken root. They grow. They all produce fruit. It's God's grace. God's grace reigns on the just and the unjust. Scripture says that. But Jeremiah says, instead of these individuals thanking you, Lord, for your goodness and worshiping you, they actually are hypocrites. Because they mouth dedicated phrases of worship without that reality being within their hearts. Verse 2 in the NIV says, you are always on their lips, but you are far from their hearts. Now I'm just setting the stage. Jeremiah in verse 3, he contrasts the state of his own hearts. As he's wrestling with this question of why the wicked prosper, he, he basically contrasts his own heart with the state of the wicked's heart. In verse 3, he says, Lord, you know me. You know my heart, Lord. You see me. You've examined my heart's attitude towards you. You know that it's where it needs to be. Jeremiah says, their hatred for me is uncalled for. He speaks of his intimate fellowship with the Lord, and the Lord knows that he is not speaking in a hypocritical way. And in strong language, Jeremiah asked the Lord to deal with these enemies as they deserve. Drag them off like sheep for slaughter and set them apart for a day of slaughter. Lord, just take them out. In essence, isn't that what Jeremiah is saying? Lord, just take them out. That's what they deserve. God had judged the nation because of its sin of wickedness. But the righteous suffered in this as well. And in verse 4, Jeremiah's thoughts seem to center in that even in times of difficulty, the wicked seem to come through it better than the righteous do. Let's read verse 4 again. How long is the land to mourn? And the vegetation of the countryside to dry up. In other words, the drought that was given by God, it was affecting everyone. Due to the wickedness of those who live in it, animals and birds have been snatched away. Because people have said, he will not see our final end. God, why do the wicked seem to prosper and the righteous suffer? It's a question that's been asked and probably will continue to be asked until the Lord takes us home. But what is interesting is we find God's answer to Jeremiah's whys and his how longs in verse 5, do we not? 
And God's answer to Jeremiah's question was probably something of a surprise to the prophets. And maybe when we read it for the first time or even reading it now, maybe it surprises us even then. In fact, we find that God in his answer doesn't try to explain himself. He doesn't try to explain himself to Jeremiah. Because when we really think about it and we get down to to the nitty gritty, if you will, or the foundation of it all, God doesn't need to defend himself, does he? God doesn't need to defend his righteousness or the wisdom of his ways to anyone because his ways are beyond our comprehension and full understanding. And this passage reminds us that as God's servants, we do not live on explanation. We do not, I have to remind myself of this constantly. I, as a child of God, do not live on explanation. We, as children of God, rather live on promise. His promise. As we we sing this morning, He's the same God. And the promises that we have in Him, in Christ Jesus, are yes and amen. There's no if or maybe. No, God says if he has given it to us in Christ, it's there. It's our responsibility by faith to walk in it. Walk in its strength. Walk in its provision. Walk in its wisdom. We live on promise as God's children. In fact, the late Pastor Warren Worsby, and I've got this for you in the U version, notes, he stated this in one of his messages. He says, understanding explanations may satisfy our curiosity and make us smarter people. But laying hold of God's promises will build our character and make us better servants. Let that get in your spirit this morning. Understanding explanations may satisfy our curiosity and make us smarter people, but laying hold of God's promises will build our character and make us better servants. Which one do you think God is more interested in? Verse 5 tells us, because God answers Jeremiah, and this is his answer. If you have run with infantrymen, And they have tired you out. How can you compete with horses? If you fall down in a land of peace, how will you do in the thicket by the Jordan? Can you imagine? And I'm I'm not trying to, to be entertaining here or not because I don't know that I can be entertaining. But how do you think? In that moment, in just that split second, because we all have that split second reaction, don't we? We can read it all over our face. If someone answers us and it's not the answer we're looking for, can you imagine Jeremiah being, God, that's not what I asked you. In fact, that doesn't even seem to address the question I even asked. You didn't even touch on it. But it is about if we're going to find the right answer, we got to ask the right question. And when the Lord answers Jeremiah, his servant, notice that his focus is not on the wicked at all. That's where Jeremiah's focus is, but God says, that's not where my focus is. Rather, God's focus is on Jeremiah, his servant, and the call that he has placed upon his life. Because most oftentimes when I'm suffering, and maybe you fall into the same category as me, like Jeremiah, when we're suffering and we're facing hardship, that we ask the question, how can I get out of this? If you will show me the exit door, I will make a beeline for it. But rather, in hearing God's response to his servant in verse 5, should the right question rather be, Lord, what can I get out of this? Not how can I get out of it, but what can I get out of it? Because that's God's focus here. His focus is not the wicked. His focus is not the hardship. His focus is not that. His focus is his servant and how he's handling it and and, and, and how he's allowing it to mold him and frame him and prepare him. 
If Jeremiah had raced with men, and that's what God is equating the men of his hometown, the individuals that he's been prophesying up to this point in chapter 12, if he has raced with men on foot and was complaining about being worn out, God says, then how are you going to be able to compete later with horses? You know, you go to someone and you look for encouragement, and they give you this word, are you encouraged? <laughs> Oh, don't worry, it's going to get worse. In essence, isn't that what God's saying? It's like, thank you, Pastor Brian, for this encouraging message this morning. I am going to leave just uplifted like never before. No, I'm just saying. That's the question that God asked Jeremiah. And he says, Jeremiah, if you stumble in safe country, in a country that is peaceful, how are you going to be able to manage when you are thrust into the thickets of the Jordan? Then we need to understand the wordplay that God uses here. What he's talking about, the thickets of the Jordan, is he is speaking to the dense growth along the Jordan River that when the time of the Jordan River flooding, what do you think happens to the creatures or animals that are in the thickets? Where do they go? Out. So if you're in a peaceful land and you can't handle it, how are you going to respond when you're in the thickets of the Jordan? Please hang with me now. Now We know Jeremiah in obedience had spoken and has been speaking the word that had been divinely given to him in chapter 1. Words that we know are from heaven, words that are divine and words that are distinct in their purpose in warning the nation of Judah of the destruction that was to come upon them if they would not turn from their rebellion against God and repent of their disobedience. Jeremiah was faithful in proclaiming that word. In fact, Jeremiah's preaching had been to his own family, to the people of Ananoth. And the lesser princes and priests of Judas, what scripture tells and God tells Jeremiah that he has been running with footmen, but God has a bigger plan. He has a bigger plan for Jeremiah, his servant. Ananoth has been a training ground, a training ground, a place of preparation for Jeremiah for God's next. God always has a next. And before we can get to God's next, we've got to go through God's training ground. We've got to go through his place of preparation so we will be prepared to step into God's next. And if Jeremiah became weary and ready to give up while running against these footmen, then how will he be able to run against horses in Jerusalem? Have any of you tried to run with horses? It just seems impossible. In fact, isn't that what God is alluding to? I'm calling you to something that is greater than you are. I'm calling you to something that you're not going to be able to handle on your own. Something that will blow your mind and say, God, I can't. The Lord's answer to Jeremiah's complaint is meant to teach him. God now challenges Jeremiah to greater courage. God challenges Jeremiah to greater faith for greater trials in the future. And in spite of his problems up to this point, his situation, God says, has been like that of an individual that was dwelling in a peaceful land. So when we look in that, we talk about that this morning. What does this passage in Jeremiah teach us today? What lesson does it have for us today? What is the word that God would speak to us as a fellowship of the body of Christ and as individual members of it? There are two points of application that I would like for us to consider from Jeremiah 12 and verse 5. And that is, number one, the, God, the life of godly service isn't easy. And let's be honest. 
Did God ever say that this walk of faith was going to be a walk in the park, as we would say? A piece of cake. That it was just going to be easy. Everything was just going to fall in place all the time. If that were the case, why do we need faith? Why do we even need to walk in faith? God says it's all going to turn out. It's all going to fall together. You ain't going to have to worry about anything. It's all going to be good. But the truth is the life of godly service isn't easy. There are those who claim that God's sole desire is that we have a happy life. That somehow we have taken on the declaration of independence for our nation as the reality of our walk with God. And within the declaration, we are promised life, liberty, and the pursuit of what? Happiness. But some have believed that God's sole desire is that we have a happy life. The only problem with that theology is it's not biblical. The Bible does not say that happiness is our strength, does it? No, the joy of the Lord is our strength. Joy that comes from knowing that I am his child and that he is my father and that we are his own possession. Well, how do I know that? First Peter chapter 1 and 2, read it. That's God's promise to us. Joy that comes from knowing no matter where I go in this life, I am walking, in, and if I'm walking in obedient faith to God's word, he will always be by my side and sustain me. Joy that comes from knowing that this is not my home. I am simply a sojourner in this land, and heaven awaits. A heaven that cannot be compared to the light afflictions of this world. Am I saying that God doesn't care? No, God does care. Psalm 55, 1 Peter chapter 5. Cast your cares upon the Lord. Why? Because he cares for us. He'll sustain us. The Lord does care. The psalm says he is aware of our difficulty. He literally saves our tears in his bottle. God's aware. Yes, God cares. The very essence of the scripture, its very foundation to us as believers, hang with me, is that we are saved by God's grace through faith in the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Therefore, as those whom he has redeemed, we are to strive to live in a way that is pleasing to him. In other words, we are seeking to be like Jesus, serving him and one another in love to further the kingdom through word and through our deed until he comes back. That speaks of our faithfulness to him because he is faithful to us but I'm here to tell you faithfulness is not easy and the reason it's not easy is because faithfulness calls for great conviction faithfulness to the Lord and his word and his way calls for great discipline faithfulness calls for great determination faithfulness calls for great sacrifice and it also calls for an internal fortitude in other words it calls for spiritual guts if you will because it's not easy. And God knows that. Mark 8, 34, 35, Jesus told the disciples from the very beginning what they were getting into. He defined his Messiahship. He defined what it meant to identify with him. He says, if you want to come after me, you must deny yourself. You must take up your cross and follow me. Because we serve the God who chose the cross so we could be redeemed. And he says, whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever will lose their life willingly for his sake, they will will save it. They will gain it. He commands us to love our enemies, to turn the other cheek and to give everything for God's sake, for his word, to lay down our lives as he has laid his down. And how can I rectify those commands with the comfort giving, pleasure loving God that some worship? Is there comfort? Is there pleasure in serving the Lord? Absolutely. Paul tells us in Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Yes. Strengthened for what? 
strength to do what needs to be done to fulfill God's will. But listen, I must not mistake having strength with the task being easy. As God's child, as his servant, I cannot mistake having strength with the task being easy. If that's my definition of strength that is given to us here in Philippians 4.13, then my definition will lead me to question where God is when things get hard. Am I willing to do whatever the hard thing is that God is calling me to today, or will I let the easy path lure me into a false Christianity? The life of godly service isn't easy. But the second point that we can glean from this truth that the Lord has stirred my heart about is this, the life of godly service gets better as we grow more mature. Can we say amen to that? You that have served the Lord, you that have known hardship and difficulty, can you not witness this morning in the Lord that the life of godly service gets better as we grow more mature and we give ourselves to whatever God calls us to? Because we find He is faithful, amen? We find He is sufficient, amen? We find that He does sustain us, amen? We find that He does not allow us to be shaken by the things that we face because nothing we face is greater than God. Each new challenge, the horses, the jungles, the opposition of relatives were to help Jeremiah develop his faith and to grow in his ministry skills. The easy life is ultimately the hard life. The easy life is ultimately the hard life because the easy life stifles maturity. We cannot grow and will not grow in the easy life because the easy life does not require faith. The easy life does not require trusting the Lord and believing the Lord and being held by the Lord when there is no other option but God. The difficult life challenges us to develop our spiritual muscles and to accomplish more for the Lord. In fact, the late minister Philip Brooks wrote this, the purpose of life, the purpose of life is to build character. It is the building of character through truth. And you don't build character by being a spectator. You have to run with endurance the race God sets before you and do it on God's terms. Hebrews 12, verses 1 through 3, as the musicians come. Therefore, since we also have such a great cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let's rid ourselves of every obstacle and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let's run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking only at Jesus, the originator and perfecter of the faith, who for the joy that was set before him, here it is, endured the cross, despising the shame, and has set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Revelation 3, 21, 22. As Christ is speaking to the churches, he says this to the one who overcomes. I will grant them to sit down with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Verse 22, the one who has ears to hear, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. As we close this morning and come to a place of decision, come to a place of embracing the word so that it may be profitable in and through our lives. That it's not just something we hear, but it becomes who we are. God was concerned about the development of his servant. Not just the difficulties around him. God was concerned about the development of Jeremiah. Because you know what? God can handle the problems. He can handle the problem people. He can handle the problem circumstances. It doesn't matter. God can handle that. But God couldn't force Jeremiah to grow. He won't. 
Only Jeremiah can make the choice by staying in the race, staying in it, accepting the new challenges and thereby maturing in the Lord. And it is the same with us this morning. Please understand, I am not making light of any difficulty you have faced, you are facing, or ever will face. That somehow, because we're discouraged, that we should be shamed. Absolutely not. God knows our frame. Thank the Lord. And that we are weak. He is strong. But in the same way as with Jeremiah, God is concerned about our spiritual development. God can handle the problems, but He will not force us to grow. Only we can make the choice by staying in the race, accepting every new challenge with the sure knowledge that I can do all things through Christ who what? Strengthens me. Come on, say it. I can do all things through Christ who what? Strengthens me. Am I willing, am I a yielded vessel to allow God to take me to the hard things? None of us like hard things. I don't know many people that just like difficulties or hardships, times of testing. But are we willing to allow God, can we surrender to Him and say, Lord, wherever you want to take me, I'm willing to go because God is always calling us to the next. Are we willing to allow God to take us to his next? As individuals and as a corporate body or corporate fellowship of the body of Christ, are we willing to allow God to take us to his next? Knowing that this race is not easy, but understanding That it does, as the songs say, it gets sweeter as the days go by. Does it not? It does. It can. God can make it sweeter, and He does make it sweeter. So that we can say always, Lord, I say yes to your next. Can we stand together this morning? Lord, I say yes to your next. Lord, I say yes to your next. Come on, as we end the service this morning, as they lead us in worship, as they begin to sing, I'm going to ask everyone who will, who would say, Lord, I say yes to your next. For this fellowship and for my life, for my family, Lord, I say yes to your next. They begin to sing, I'm going to ask you to come.